Looking here at Luke chapter 2 in these verses that we've read here, it, it kind of brings us to a place now where we are able to get what we celebrate today as Christmas, the day in which Christ was born. The Bible says in verse 8, as it reminds us here, really, the idea and the theme of these verses that we read is glory in the highest. And notice the statement that's being made here, that the Lord, in his mercy and grace, appeared to these shepherds. And I love this because when you consider shepherds in the Bible, this is, this is like the most insignificant job, if you will. Remember when the children of Israel were there in Egypt as they went there with uh, their father, uh, uh, Jacob, and uh, Joseph uh, brought his family there after the famine. There was an interesting thing that transpired because they came as shepherds into Egypt. And the Bible says here that they were able to um, gather uh, some land there in Egypt, but the Egyptians viewed the task of shepherding as something unclean. So it wasn't something looked upon favorably, but it was a common practice among the people of Israel. And even the greatest king Israel ever had, David, was a shepherd. God would use shepherding as a model or a tool, if you will, to lead his people. But if we look at it from the perspective as the world would consider these shepherds, like the people of Egypt did, we could say that God came to those who were perhaps maybe not significant. He came to the lowly. He came to those who would go and share with those that this Jesus would be born. And so as the angel appeared to them, the Bible says here that the night really kind of, it receded with the light of the angels. They, it illuminated. It says it shone around them and they were greatly afraid. Now the fear obviously is a common response. It's a it's, you know, one perhaps blown away by, you know, this appearance of this angel. But then there is a fear of not knowing what this is. What they knew was it was something greater than them. And this fear is, in a sense, maybe not a fear of timidity, but more of a fear of reverence. They perhaps recognized that there was something holy about this. And then the angel said to them, do not be afraid. That is part of the Christmas story, that we don't have to fear anymore, that we don't have to live in fear, that we don't have to be men and women who struggle with fear, that we can trust that the Lord removes fear. The Bible says perfect love casts out all fear, and we can trust in that the Lord is the one who provides the means by which fear can be casted out. In the same way here, the angel says, do not be afraid, for I bring you good tidings of great joy, which will be for all people. This is the news. This is the good news. That fear can be dealt with. That there is a message. And really, this is what the angel is saying. Good tidings means good news of great joy. We sing this song, joy to the world. The Lord has come, right? Let earth receive her king. The idea behind this truly is that joy only comes from the Lord. So today, like any other day, obviously not just today, but today should be that gratitude to the Lord that we have joy in our life because Jesus came into the world. God was faithful at keeping his word. So we see here fear cast out, replaced with joy to be received, not only for shepherds but it says here for all people if you really think about this notice how he came to the lowly but it's also saying this message is for all and that's the beauty of the christmas story that it is for all not just not just a specific class or group but for all like john chapter 3 that famous passage that we always quote in regards to god's purpose and plan for humanity the Bible makes it very clear in this message, if you will, in John 3, 16. For God so loved, notice what it says here, the world. For God so loved the world. It doesn't say that God loved the perfect, that God only loved those who are of great importance. No, for God so loved the world, everybody that's in this world. God loves them. 
And it goes on to say here that he gave his only begotten son that whoever, it goes back to that same thing, the whole world, whoever believes in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. And so these shepherds might have not been significant for anyone outside of the people of Israel. But listen, if they are viewed by the world as lowly and or perhaps a, a different class, God seen it necessary to reveal to them the Savior of the world. And it goes on to say here, for there is born to you this day in the city of David a Savior who is the Christ. You know, this is the only time in the Gospels where we see here this reference to the Savior. In the Gospels, Jesus is called the Savior, the Savior of the world. What does a Savior do? Well, it's in the word. He saves. And what do you need to be saved from? I think there's several things we can consider here. Number one, the ultimate reason why Christ came is so that we can be saved from the wrath of God that will one day be poured out on the wicked and disobedient. So it's not a bad thing or too far stretched of a thing to say that God saves us from himself. That's one aspect of it. The other aspect of it is that God saves us and delivers us. Salvation has the idea behind it of deliverance. It also has the idea behind it of redeeming. And so God saves us from sin. He saves us from hell. He saves us from eternal separation from him. And this is another means by which we should be rejoicing. When I think of this here, the, the title here, a savior who is Christ the Lord, it reminds me of what Paul writes in Galatians chapter four. Look at what Paul says here. Paul says this, but when the fullness of time, verse four had come, God sent forth his son, born of a woman and born under the law to redeem. Notice the purpose, the mission to redeem those who are under the law that we might receive the adoption as sons. Notice this. God's desire is that we would be children of God, that we would be his children. So he sent the means necessary to be able to make that happen in our lives. And then it says in verse six, because you are sons, God has sent forth the spirit of his son. Now, this is speaking about the Holy Spirit into your hearts, crying out, Abba, Father. So God sends his son to redeem people so that we can be part of his family, it says in verse five. And then God gives us his spirit so that we can live, that we can yearn, that we can long to be with the Lord, to trust the Lord, to follow after the Lord. And then it reminds us that our lives are different as a result of God's doing. In verse 7, it says, Therefore, you are no longer a slave, but a son. Isn't that an amazing thing? You're no longer a slave, but a son. And if a son, then an heir of God through Christ. You know what an heir means? An heir means one who is going to inherit. So all of us have an inheritance coming. That's a good Christmas, you know, gift. Put it that way. Amen. So so we, we're we're co-heirs with Christ, but we're we're an heir of God. You know what that means? That means that everything the father has given the son will also be given to us. Everything. Eternity. God is an eternal God. How, how can we be heirs of God? Well, we receive eternal life. And I'm always reminded of, remember what John is writing in John chapter 15, where right around verse nine, he talks about this love and he talks about just the value of God's love. And, and, and what Jesus says to the disciples, John records it, but it just reminds us of what it is to be an heir or co-heirs with Christ and co-heirs with God. Jesus says, as the father has loved me, I also have loved you. There is what it is to be an heir. As the father has loved me, I also have loved you. Notice that there's no, there's no indifference there. The love that the father has, has loved Christ the son with, Jesus in turn says the very same power, the very same weight, the very same measure, the very same way I have loved you. 
So one would say, well, you know, I've, I've never really experienced the love of the Father, but I know the love of Christ. Christ would say, if you know the love of Christ, you've known the love of the Father. That, that God doesn't leave us wanting. He doesn't leave us lacking. God gives us all that we need, and he, and he does it liberally, and he does it faithfully, and he does it by demonstrating what we are celebrating today, that he gave us his son, Jesus. For what purpose? Well, we just read it in Galatians 4 to redeem those who are under the law. To redeem those who, no matter what they try to do, by their own doing, could never in their own works be made right with God. It could only be done through what God has provided. And ultimately, what he's saying here, we can be delivered as well and redeemed from tirelessly trying to do by our own hands deeds that would make us right with God. You will spend a lifetime doing deeds and you will never be right with God. So God didn't send his son Jesus so we could live a life under the law, but that we can live a life that is freed from the law, a life that is experiencing grace. And we might say to ourselves, we don't deserve it. That's exactly what grace is. And the beauty of this here is that this is what Paul sums up. In a sense, you could say in Galatians chapter 4 is the Christmas story. Then he says, "Have arm yourself with this. You are adopted sons and daughters of the living God. You are heirs of God through Christ. You are co-heirs with Christ. He says, you're no longer a slave, but you're a son. And if you're a son, then pretty much he says, this is my paraphrase, then live like it. Live like Christ has come. Live like all the promises of God are yes and amen in Christ Jesus. So this is what it means here. The Savior who is Christ the Lord. And this will be a sign to you. You will find a babe wrapped in swaddling cloths lying in a manger. Now remember, we talked a little bit about this yesterday in our Christmas you know, message. But this picture here in verse 12 really is the purpose by which Christ came. Christ came to die. And his life would be a life that would be lived out perfectly in this world. A perfect life without any infractions, without any sin, without any. Nobody could ever say he did this bad or he did that bad. I mean, many can say a lot of things about us, right? There's a whole lot of things that people can say about us, but nobody could ever say anything about Jesus. Even when they tried Jesus, even when they tried him, they could not find no fault in him. So then you say, then why was he crucified? Because it was a part of God's plan. That Jesus would be the sinless lamb of God who would take away the sins of the world. And so he came as this little babe and and the manger is, is, you know, this stone that is carved out. And that's what a manger is. And they put water in there. They put feed in there. And it's a feeding trough. And they laid baby Jesus in this manger. And they wrapped him in swaddling cloths. The same garments that are used to wrap around baby lambs that are being prepared for the slaughter. To be offered up as a sacrifice. They wrap Christ in the same thing. It's like the image there and the picture. And if you really think about it, it's not a nice scene. Neither was the cross. The manger was a place where animals would eat and use the restroom. And, you know, nobody slept there. Nobody spent any time there, let alone here. Now you have Joseph and Mary giving birth to the savior of the world. I mean, really think about it if you were given that opportunity you would prepare a place that would be magnificent and comfortable and and beautiful and all of that and the lord says no this manger is a perfect place because it depicts what his life is going to be given for the mess of this world and wasn't that what our life was wasn't it a mess before we came to the lord anybody here or you guys were all perfect huh i get it i mean our lives were messes mine was yours was and sometimes we might forget the mess that God pulled us out of. But a time like this, Christmas, should always remind us of the cesspool of humanity that Christ came down into, but also the mess that Christ saved us from. 
And suddenly there was an angel, a multitude of heavenly hosts praying, praising God and saying, glory to God in the highest. You see the word there, highest, that actually has the idea of heaven. They're saying glory to God in heaven and on earth, peace, goodwill toward all men. So what do we see here? Peace toward men or toward men on whom God's sovereign pleasure rests. God delighted in providing the means. God, God delights in the fact that you are no longer slaves, as we just read, right? But now we are sons. We are children of God. God delights in that. Glory to God in the highest. And on earth, peace, goodwill toward men. Th this, in a sense, I would say, is not only a praise, but it's also a praise with promise that we can have peace. Now, I know that today there are pageants and these things that draw the attention of the world there it's like a world pageant you know and 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 people from all over you know women rather and uh they they go and try to be the the one voted for their country right and when they kind of get down now to you know um the finalist of all this then they begin to ask them certain question and it's interesting because you can almost say what they're going to say. All of them start with world peace. And every politician, at least in this country, that, that is shooting for a position of authority or office, or w one thing they will say is they say, you know, my job is to try to bring peace. And, and some would even say world peace. But you guys know that we could never have peace until the Prince of Peace comes. So what man is longing for, God has provided for you to have in your own heart and in your own lives. Yes, the world might not have peace because it is a fallen world, but your heart can have peace in this fallen world. And this is why he says here, you could be at peace with God, at peace with men. So it was when the angels had gone away from them into heaven that the shepherds said to one another, let us now go to Bethlehem. And see this thing that has come to pass, which the Lord has made known to us. Let us see this thing that has come to pass that the Lord has made known to us. And what I think is interesting here is that we can see that this is what God wants us to do. To, to draw us, to, to bring us to that place, to draw us to, so that we can come and we can see. We can see what the Lord has done. We can see what the Lord is desiring to show us. And, and he does this. So the shepherds go and they say, let us now go. God gives us the promises of his word so that we can seek those things out. And just like the shepherds go and seek or willing to go and see the things. And they came and with haste and found Mary and Joseph and the babe lying in a manger. I love how it says here they came with haste. In other words, they let nothing get in the way. They let nothing distract them. They let nothing deter them from their assignment and their mission. Imagine if Jesus would have gotten distracted. We live in a day and age of distractions, boy, I'll tell you. We are easily distracted by many things. We're distracted by devices we carry in our hands. You know, we're distracted by, you know, things that we see, perhaps even things that others have and we don't. We're distracted by so many things that we, that we lose sight of really Christ being the object of our affection, the object of our living. And those distractions are there, rightly so, by the enemy, wanting to distract us from experiencing this joy and this peace, this removal of fear that we see, all the things that have come now with the babe, that they're going to look for in this manger. And it says here that they found Mary and Joseph and the babe lying in the manger. In other words, just like it was said. You could imagine the scene as they walked up. Now for the shepherds, it wouldn't have been that far fetched. They would have been like, oh, a manger. They're used to mangers, right? But you could imagine the scene with Mary and Joseph and there the babe lying in the manger. So this nativity story, we always talk about this. There's no, there's no wise men here. The wise men come later, but the shepherds are here. Now, when they had seen, 
they made widely known. You know, verse 17, I think, is important because they're saying here that they are making it known what they are saying. And it says here, saying, which was told them concerning the child. So what did that mean? They were going and teaching everyone. This is what is to be said of this child. So they were teaching everyone what they were told. And what were they teaching everyone? This is the Christ, the Savior who has come into the world. So they went, the shepherds went about teaching. And then in verse 18, it says, And all those who heard marveled at those things which were told them by the shepherds. So as they, as they heard this, they were blown away. But Mary, because remember, the angel of the Lord had revealed to Mary who her child was. Her child was Jesus. Yeshua saves is what the name Jesus means, that, that he is the Savior. That ultimately her son coming into the world will be Emmanuel, God with us. And so what did she do? She didn't take the time to go and teach these things, but the shepherds went and shared the good tidings, the good news. Hey, listen, do not be afraid. Be joyful. Receive now the Savior of the world is here. You can be freed and you can be delivered and you can be redeemed and you can be taken in by the Lord rather than cast out. So the Savior has come. But Mary kept all these things and pondered them in her heart. She treasured what was told to her and then she's seen it before her eyes. You know, when I look at this passage, I can only be reminded of in Deuteronomy chapter 6 where the Lord instructs the parents to teach their children. And, and it says there to teach them, you know, when they wake up, you know, in the middle of the day when they're going about and when they lie down to go to bed. Morning, noon, and night. To instruct them in the word of the Lord and, and, and to give them the word of God. I can only imagine when Mary was instructing Jesus as a baby, all the passages that she would read knowing that they were talking about her son. And maybe even those difficult passages where we see like in the prophet Isaiah. Where it talks about him being wounded and bruised. And ultimately his life being offered up. Those are the things that she treasured in her heart. And then we see here in verse 20, then the shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all the things they had heard and seen as it was told them. As we kind of wrap this up here, there's a couple of things you want to look at. Number one, the shepherds begin to teach. And I think for us today, that's just something we can take away from this is we can teach. We can teach our children. We could also teach those around us at work and, uh, you know, relationships that we have. Maybe not so much teaching the Bible, but you can live the Bible out for others to see. You know, it's an interesting thing. People say, you know, I just want to share the Bible, but, but I don't know the word. And I always tell them, well, you might not know the word, but you can obey it and live it out for others to see. And then they're like, oh, no, I'd, I'd rather teach it. You know, no, listen, we got to practice what we preach and teach it doesn't say perfectly but at least attempt to and you might say well I, you know i just need strength well we just read it in galatians 4 he's given us the spirit of his son he's given us the holy spirit so when you find yourself wrestling with lord can i be a teacher maybe not in word but by example it's that phrase that we always quote. We say that it was St. Francis of Assisi, but the quote goes this way, preach the gospel often and when necessary, use words. That should be our lives. Not so much just a telling in the area of teaching, but a living because examples are the greatest ways a person can learn. Because an example is, it's a lifelong thing. It's easy to tell somebody what to do, right? It's a whole nother thing to demonstrate it 
by your sacrifice and your living according to it. So teach. So this year we have coming, if the Lord tarries, this is not the New Year's message, but I'm just going to lay it out this way. If the Lord tarries and we have 2024, look back on 2023 and ask yourself, was I a good example? Have I done all that I could to teach either by word or by exampleship. Second thing, the Bible says in verse 19 that Mary kept all these things in her heart. She treasured this good news. She treasured the hope of glory. She treasured now that the Savior has come. She treasured that man does not have to be bound by fear, that man can be free, that he's no longer having to be a slave, that he can be delivered. She, tre she kept all these things in her heart. Do we treasure the gospel in our heart? Do we keep these things in our heart? Do we hold them near and dear to us? Or do we treat the gospel or this message as perhaps some do this way, as just a story from a book? Or you know what? I am only go to church because um, I, I have to. Not because you want to. Or, you know, I, I uh, you know, am a Christian because my parents were Christian. There's no generational Christianity, okay? God doesn't have grandchildren. He only has sons and daughters. If you treasure it in your heart, you will, you will ponder them in your heart. The word here, ponder, has the idea to, to meditate upon these things continually. In other words, that you're keeping what is said of who Jesus is and what his purpose is near and dear, close to your heart, because this is of great value to you. Just like you are a great value to God, so much so that he gave his son to die for your sins. And thirdly, the shepherds returned glorifying and praising God for all the things that they had heard and seen and it was told them. Go and tell. Go and tell not only the story of Jesus, the Savior who's come into the world, but go and tell your story. Your story doesn't have to be theologically sound. It doesn't have to be a three-point sermon. Your story is simply this. You were a sinner in need of a Savior and Christ came to set you free. Your story is you were once lost, but now you're found. Your story is you once were this way or that way, and the Lord did this, or you were in dire straits. Maybe you were on your deathbed. Maybe you were close to dying or whatever it was, and the Lord met you there and miraculously delivered you and used those things to draw you to a place where you had nowhere else to turn but God. Go tell your story. I think we all can be encouraged with that. Amen? Because every single one of you here have a story to tell. And when you tell the story, you know what you begin to realize? You begin to treasure how your story came about. You begin to treasure. Then you begin to teach by example because we are no longer who we used to be. Remember, once again, Galatians, Paul says this in chapter 4 and verse 7. Therefore, you are no longer a slave but a son. And if a son, then an heir of God through Christ. Think about that, an heir of God through Christ. You know, when you meet rich people, I'm talking filthy rich people, and you meet their kids, you're like, man, they're going to inherit a mess load of money, man. You know, the kids, isn't like they're really going to, they're going to they're gonna be blessed. And they walk around like it's just a matter of time. They, they walk around. It's like they, you could see it, right? You could see it. And, and we, all, we all have seen it in the, in the world. You can see it. You, know, you, you might not maybe see it in your family or whatever, but you'll see it with celebrities and you'll see this. And it's like that next generation, they're already carrying themselves like they're the ones that made all the money. Do you guys not see that? Now, I know that for us, we look at that and we're in here, we're like, oh, yeah, yeah, you know, I wouldn't do that. You better do that because you're a co-heir with Christ. You better walk around like you got eternal life. You better walk around like you're on your way to heaven. You better walk around like you're already rich because the word of God. Walk around like you're saved and you've been redeemed and you're not worrying about the wrath of God that's going to come upon the sons of disobedience. That doesn't mean you go and Bible thump others too and tell them turn or burn. 
Tell them your story so that they will know that there's a story that the Lord has for them as well. It all starts with Jesus. It all starts with, and he makes it so simple, the babe in Bethlehem. Let's pray. Father.